So I'm now going to introduce Ron Seufer. Ron Seufer is the senior vice president and the general counsel, as I mentioned before, of Unilever USA and of the Americas. He was also the person who was across the table from me the most when we were doing these negotiations. And I can tell you that he's a wonderful guy, and sometimes his eyes and my eyes communicated without words in very substantially important ways. So Ron, you want to come up? Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have to say that you covered a lot of territory in your introduction. So like any courtroom proceeding, I think I'm entitled to some rebuttal <laughs> after, after all of that. Uh, but let me just say, let me just uh, acknowledge uh, what Terry had to say and simply say that I'm present here because I was lead counsel for Unilever during this very extraordinary transaction during the years 1999 and the year 2000. And uh, I'm a corporate lawyer by trade. I practiced law for over 25 years, the last 14 of them at Unilever. And I have to tell you that by the time of the Ben & Jerry's transaction, I had negotiated the purchase and sale of about 50 different companies, large and small. But I have to say the Ben & Jerry's transaction was a very unique and challenging experience, and I will always remember that transaction. <laughs> now, let me say, that, especially for some of the characters that were involved in it, including Terry. Now, let me say this. You may, some of you may remember this cartoon, which ran in the Wall Street Journal the day after, the day after Unilever signed two acquisitions on the same day, Ben and & Jerry's and SlimFast. The SlimFast transaction was a much larger transaction, but it was much more conventional. It was consummated in a matter of weeks, with all the really heavy lifting done in the very last weekend. It was a private company, very straightforward. And then we had the Ben & Jerry's transaction, which spanned 18 months to address all kinds of complex governance issues and competitive issues, competitive bidding issues. And of course, it was a public transaction. Now, I have to say that the Ben & Jerry's transaction has been a very successful acquisition for Unilever. And I'm going to give you my personal view as a Unilever employee that a large measure of Ben & Jerry's success within Unilever has been the result of the governance mechanism we put in place to ensure that Ben & Jerry's social mission and the integrity of the brand were preserved. To use Hirschberg's language from yesterday, the governance, the governance mechanism was, is not an easy one, but it has created creative tension, which I think has been extremely good for the relationship between Unilever and the Ben and Jerry's board. And I think it has benefited Unilever in the long run. Now, my story with the Ben and Jerry's transaction begins in 1999. Dick Goldstein, the president of Unilever US, walked into my office and said Unilever had made a strategic decision to bid for Ben and Jerry's. He said we would be bidding against one of our key rivals in the ice cream business globally. He said that the board of Ben & Jerry's would prefer to remain independent. And he said, Seufer, I know you've worked on a lot of transactions, but you better do a good job on this one because it's really going to be complex. And he said we're going to have to be very creative and we will need to collaboratively create a governance structure which will set our bid apart from our rivals. He was right. This was one of the most unique transactions I've ever worked on. And I have to say that the unique governance structure we put in as a team is something that I'm particularly proud of. I think the team put this together, and by the team I mean all the different parties to the transaction. Because during most of the transaction, we worked quite constructively grappling with what are real issues, real governance issues. So. Let me now turn to the formal part of the, of the presentation. What was the challenge before we signed this deal in April of 2000? Well, we needed to develop a governance structure that would be acceptable to both the Ben & Jerry's board and Unilever that would do two things. 
It would enable Unilever to acquire Ben & Jerry's and achieve its business objectives while preserving the social mission of Ben & Jerry's and safeguarding the integrity of the Ben & Jerry's brand. Now, what were Unilever's objectives in this process? As the premier global ice cream company, we were determined to acquire a super premium brand in the United States, the largest market. We didn't have one. And this was a time when Nestle had entered into a very interesting joint venture, which owned the Haagen-Dazs brand, which is the rival super premium brand in the United States. So Unilever saw this happening. And number two, Unilever saw that Nestle had a significant investment in dryers, a California-based company, and to our way of thinking was using dryers to make a bid for Ben & Jerry's. So what could have happened is that Nestle could have ended up with a controlling interest in both of the super premium brands in the United States. That was unacceptable to us. Now, the second of our major objectives was to make sure that if we acquired Ben & Jerry's, we needed enough management flexibility on financial and operational aspects of Ben & Jerry's. And secondly, we wanted to make sure that Ben & Jerry's employees abided by key corporate compliance principles. In other words, our key financial, accounting, and legal principles and policies, including our code of business principles. Our third objective was we wanted to make sure that whatever we did in the transaction, we retained the loyalty of Ben & Jerry's consumers. And the only way to do that would be by respecting the brand heritage of Ben & Jerry's. If we didn't do that, we might as well throw away our investment in the company. And finally, a potential benefit to some of us on the team was to see whether if we brought Ben & Jerry's in the fold, are there some learnings and benefits from Ben & Jerry's social mission that could be applied to our other businesses? Now, those are the four objectives of Unilever. Now, what were the challenges we were facing to achieve those objectives? First, and by the way, these are the challenges uh, that we discussed night after night and with the best intelligence that we had under the circumstances. So we knew that Ben & Jerry's board was skeptical of the motives of any multinational. We knew that, as you just described, that Ben & Jerry's had successfully amended the Vermont Business Corporation Law, as you said, to allow the boards of directors of a Vermont corporation to take into account interests in addition to the financial interests of shareholders, so that the board of that company, under the language of the statute, would not have to be guided by what was the highest offering price to shareholders, but instead the board could take cognizance and respect the interests of the community and the interests of the employees. Our third challenge, of course, was that Dryers was making a competitive bid, and, uh, and, and that was a serious one, as Terry has described. Now, those were the objectives and challenges of a Unilever. Now, what were the objectives and challenges faced by the Ben & Jerry's board? Well, as best we knew, these were the objectives of the Ben & Jerry's board. Ben and Jer the, the board wanted to remain independent. But if they couldn't stay independent, the board wanted to ensure the preservation of the social mission and safeguard the integrity of the brand. And to do that, the board wanted a self-sustaining legal governance structure that would bind the acquiring company doesn't say here, but in perpetuity. I think that's one of the key differences from some of the other presentations we've heard about other companies that were acquired. This was something that the Ben & Jerry's board understood. They wanted something that would stay in place in perpetuity. Third, the Ben & Jerry's board wanted to make sure that the social mission remained fully integrated with operations. It wouldn't be treated as a sideshow to what the company was doing. Fourth, the governance structure had to be visible to the public, to have credibility, and also to Ben & Jerry's employees. And finally, there were members of the Ben & Jerry's board who wanted to make a difference in the business practices of the acquiring company. 
Now, what were the challenges that the Ben and Jerry's board faced to meet its objectives? First, what we knew was that Ben and Jerry's own management and consultants had doubts about Ben and Jerry's ability to remain independent in the long term. Much of Ben and Jerry's distribution was controlled, in a way, surprisingly, by its competitors. I have dryers here, but Pillsbury was also a, uh, a distributor. I think distribution is something that we've heard also as a common theme in some of the presentations here at this conference. Uh, distribution is a real challenge for young, socially responsible companies. So we knew that Ben & Jerry's was facing difficulties, and although it wanted to remain independent, we knew they knew, and their experts knew, they might not be able to do so. Secondly, again, as, as you, as Terry and Pierre has, have already pointed out, although this new Vermont Business Corporation law had this nice new provision, which said that a board of directors could take cognizance of additional interests beyond the financial interests of shareholders, we also did our legal research. We found no cases construing that. And what we decided as a strategy was that we would offer a certain amount per share, which would be sufficiently high so that a board of directors following traditional fiduciary duties would realize that they've got to accept that offer, especially in the absence of any case law that would give them, give them a safe harbor to the contrary. So that was our strategy in dealing with the new Vermont Business Corporation law. And third, it was clear to us in the discussions that there were disagreements among Ben & Jerry's board members and particularly between the Ben & Jerry's board and Ben & Jerry's management about how to address these challenges. It was striking to us in the course of these discussions. Normally when we acquire a company, you know, the management and the board are in lockstep to have an effective negotiation posture. Here it was very apparent that there were fissures uh, within the board and between the board and management. Now, now I'm going to take a few minutes and actually describe the, the legal governance structure that was agreed to by Unilever and by the Ben and Jerry's board. And I have to say, uh, this was, th there was no linear progression in these uh, negotiations. Uh, they went all over the place. I think you had a sense from Terry, you had a flavor from Terry about what was happening here. It was an amazing situation. Uh, certain days we thought we were, we were about to acquire a portion of Ben & Jerry's. Other days we thought Dryers was about to acquire all of Ben & Jerry's. Then it looked like uh, a different group altogether was going to uh, acquire Ben & Jerry's, led, led by Terry and his colleagues. Um, we sat patiently, and all we could do was control what, what we could do uh, in terms of what we were offering and reading the situation as best we can. Uh, but I have to tell you that there were very, very stormy days uh, in some of these negotiations. And this next cartoon sort of captures this. Uh, if you can read that, I hope that you can. Can you read it? It says, um, who among us dares tempt the wrath of Ben and Jerry? And you'll see uh, a, a, a very large number of ice cream cones <laughs> heading down. We thought they were, it was against the Unilever negotiation team, actually, at various, <laughs> at various times. It was a wonderful cartoon. Again, it sort of captured exactly what was happening. So what does the governance structure really consist of? Well, one key principle, of course, is how to allocate responsibility for managing, managing the business. And I'd say the most important principle is laid out in the first two bullet points. Unilever holds, and this is the language of the contract, primary responsibility for financial and operational aspects of Ben & Jerry's. In addition, all Ben & Jerry's employees uh, would have to abide by our key corporate compliance principles. Uh, again, consisting of our financial, accounting, and legal policies, including the code of business principles. These, these are very important principles to Unilever. No deal could be done unless this would be adhered to. So Unilever would have primary responsibility for financial and operational aspects, 
and those key corporate compliance principles would be adhered to. That was the bottom line for Unilever. For the Ben & Jerry's board, they would hold primary responsibility for preserving and enhancing the historical mission of Ben & Jerry's and for safeguarding the integrity of the brand. And I have to say that we worked very hard on the contract not just to have broad, ambiguous language. Um, we tried to be as concrete as possible by giving some examples of how the Ben & Jerry's board could exert its authority. And so the agreement says, for example, that the Ben & Jerry's board could prevent any action by the CEO in the areas of new product introduction, the changing of product standards and specs, the approval of the content of marketing materials, or licensing the Ben & Jerry's name if a majority of the board reasonably, reasonably believed that the action would be inconsistent with the essential integrity of the brand. Now, third major principle was that the appointment, compensation, and removal of the Ben & Jerry's CEO would be, the, would be the responsibility of Unilever, but required good faith consultation with the Ben & Jerry's board. Fourth, the annual business plan would ultimately be the responsibility of Unilever, but again, it required good faith consultation among Unilever, the board, and the CEO. Fifth, Ben and & Jerry's and Unilever, under the contract, would mutually agree on some social metrics to measure the social performance of Ben and & Jerry's and seek to have those metrics reflect an increase <coughs> Uh, in excess of the sales, of the rate of sales increases. Number six, and obviously this is really important, there was a complex board composition, but cutting through all of it, what I would say is that a majority of the board would consist of pre-acquisition directors or their nominees. Now, I just want to pour, I'll linger just for a moment on these principles because just take a look at number three and think about the other presentations we've heard at this conference. Gary Hirschberg remained in place as the CEO. Same thing was true of Honest T. Different models. Here it was clear that the CEO was not going to be one of the founders. It would be someone else. But in determining who that person would be, uh, and in, and in determining how the management would be done, you'll see that there's an effort to carve an important role to the Ben & Jerry's board to see to it that an independent majority of that board has the authority if it's protecting the Ben & Jerry's brand or it is protecting the social mission or enhancing the social mission uh, to say no on various issues. It's a different model. And what I have to say also is that this is a governance mechanism which is in perpetuity. It doesn't run out in three years, in five years, or when the founder moves on to something else. This is designed to be something that will extend in perpetuity. Now, I have to say also that in, although we spent most of our time on this governance model, and I guess there's one other point that I want to, I want to make. When I said before that we tried in the agreement to have some concrete language, not just rely on general terms. You'll recall that I said that the Ben & Jerry's board would be able to take certain actions uh, in the case of new product introduction, changing product standards, marketing materials, licensing the name. Those are just examples. Uh, but in addition, with respect to the social mission, we actually listed in the appendix to the agreement a series of principles that constituted the social mission of Ben and & Jerry's. And in addition to make this contract one that could endure over time, in addition to listing the existing priorities in the social mission, we also listed some of the items which were on the radar screen for Ben & Jerry's before the acquisition, but they had not yet implemented. 
And what we said in the, in the appendix is that uh, these are principles that the parties would act in good faith to achieve over time, subject to economic feasibility, which would be the result of good faith consultation uh, between the parties. So again, we weren't trying to have a static set of social mission principles that would be protected by the agreement. We tried to create rooms so they could evolve over time and try to give some guidance as to what those, those principles would be. Now that's the governance side of the contract. In addition, uh, we had agreement on specific employee and operational matters that were designed to protect the interests of Ben & Jerry's employees, the Vermont communities in which the facilities were located, and the social mission as well. So there were a wide range of very specific commitments that Unilever made, which were more time limited, but uh, directly addressed some of those issues. Now, I may be running a little bit long, so let me, let me move quickly here. Um, let me talk about what we see as some of the continuing challenges to this legal governance structure, which again is supposed to last in perpetuity. First of all, changes in key management personnel. You've heard the name Richard Goldstein a number of times uh, this afternoon. He was the president of Unilever United States at the time of the acquisition. I think it's fair to say that he personified Unilever in the eyes of the Ben & Jerry's board. It's one thing to hear that you're being acquired by Unilever, a multinational. It's another thing to spend 18 months with a team of people and get to know them and get comfortable with them. And that team was led by Dick Goldstein. But Dick ultimately left the business very shortly, and I mean really shortly, uh, after, the, after the transaction. Uh, so it was very important that we had the personal commitment of the two Unilever chairmen in, in London. But I have to say the two Unilever chairmen have since gone on to other things as well. So, uh, in fact, there's only one member left of the negotiation team uh, on behalf of Unilever. Um, and you're looking at him. Uh, so the continuous turnover of personnel in a multinational company, to our mind, requires governance structures to be in place that will survive changes in personal relationships. It's really important. Secondly, board continuity and succession. You know, we've provided a, um, a role for the Ben & Jerry's board on some key areas in the business, and that role continues on. It's not limited again by three years or the tenure of the current CEO, current founder. That's going to extend on. There's no sunset provision in the agreement. So one challenge of the Ben & Jerry's board is to develop a new generation of board members who again will be, I've used the word here, steeped in the Ben & Jerry's social mission and frankly are uh, savvy and sensitive to the relationship with Unilever. And yet this has to be done in a way that will not be disruptive of the working rapport of the board because again, a lot of people around the board now have a working relationship we have to introduce new members over time. How do you do that in a way which will not disrupt the working rapport of the board? The third challenge is that now that Ben & Jerry's is part of a much larger company, you know, challenges in other parts of the Unilever business can have an impact on Ben & Jerry's. And, you know, if, if the ice cream business in the rest of North America isn't doing well, let's say, if that, were, if that happens, you know, marketing expenditures uh, for Ben & Jerry's could suffer. Uh, so you're in a much bigger pond now and if there's a ripple that goes across that pond, you know, it can affect everybody. Okay, uh, three more challenges that I'd, like to, uh, that I'd like to point out. One is that the way a multinational, I think most multinationals work, uh, the, um, the skeleton of a multinational is their, their budget process. Uh, and it is a very complex process for a multinational. And the only way it works is if it has relentless time, timing deadlines. And so if someone wants to get input into that process, you've got to meet those timelines. 
Um, and so if, well, we'll come back to that in a second. International distribution. Uh, the social mission of the United States is very clear, at least the current uh, version of it. Uh, it will be evolving over time, but the thrust of it is clear to the U.S., it's clear to U.S. consumers, clear to U.S. employees. Uh, but how do you bring that social mission to life outside the geography where it evolved? Because one of the things that Unilever obviously brings here is the ability to, um, to launch the Ben & Jerry's brand in other geographies uh, in a very robust way. And sixth, um, it's a challenge to try to influence social mission issues at the parent company level. And it's a challenge that the Ben & Jerry's board has grappled with. And I would, I would venture to say that it is something that's still a work in process. OK, so uh, a couple more slides. Key learnings overall. Uh, Robert Frost, an American poet, has a wonderful poem. Uh, but one of the lines I like the best is a line that says, good fences make good neighbors. And I think that means that a good legally binding contract that clearly defines roles and obligations you know, is important in many relationships. And I think it has smoothed the relationship between Unilever and the Ben & Jerry's board. You know, if a contract is clear, uh, no enforcement action on the contract is necessary. A good contract means no litigation results. Uh, and so our view is that in this type of transaction, any social responsible company that's going to be acquired, you need to spend substantial time and effort on the contract at the time of the acquisition. As I said before, it has to survive the personnel who negotiate the transaction. And it's difficult, and I say here, potentially dangerous to amend thereafter. So you've got to do it at the time of the acquisition. Secondly, um, like in most relationships, it would seem to me that um, the parties have to share at least some values. There has to be some overlap in values. Um, and that's true in business relationships. It's, it's true in personal relationships. Um, and the one thing that I would say is that uh, Ben & Jerry's and Unilever are very different companies in a lot of different ways. Uh, but Unilever has its own long-standing tradition as a socially responsible company. It's true, it's through the lens of a European headquartered multinational. But especially in the areas of sustainability, environmental protection, and business ethics, uh, we have a tradition that we are proud of. And you'll forgive me one slide where I show uh, a number of things that Unilever has done from an environmental perspective, where Unilever has globally set environmental targets, has publicly tracked progress against those targets since 1995, not something that ju they've just done recently, it's since 1995. And I think if you take a look at least, these are just four measures that are on the website, pursuant to reports that Unilever does on an annual basis, and you'll see some rather dramatic progress in some areas. I mean, you see water. And by the way, this is usage in Unilever's manufacturing facilities in the aggregate throughout the world. You'll see the usage of water, for example, more than halved since 1995 uh, and the present. And you'll see the targets. By the way, targets for energy, for CO2, for total waste. You can see the targets for 2006. And you can see the actual performance in 2006, for example, and you'll see in each case Unilever has beaten its target. And if you take a look at the 10-year um, the trend, 11-year trend, uh, in this area Unilever has something that it's proud of. And so I guess as the one representative of a multinational present here today, uh, let me ask you, please do not paint all multinationals with the same color brush. Um, in areas where some multinationals have made some important progress, you know, in areas of social responsibility, I think they should be recognized and encouraged if you want more progress to, uh, to flow. So that's my one editorial comment. Now I'll go back um, and, and 
and point to learning number three. Uh, and I alluded to this earlier. It is that to fulfill its role effectively, the board has to act quickly and provide input if it wants to influence the, a, a very complex annual budget process. And you know something, even under the best of circumstances, it's a challenge. But if you don't try to influence the decisions during the budget process, you will find that once the budget is locked in, it will constrain decision making during the rest of the year. And that is a challenge that the, uh, the Ben and Jerry's board has been grappling with. And let me go to, uh, I guess, one, one final key learning, number four, which is to say that one of the things that the Ben and Jerry's board has spent some time on most, most recently is looking into the European launch of the brand and how it's doing. And you know, it's very clear to, to, the, to the board that international distribution of the brand and its social mission really must be attuned to, to local cultures. It has to be done really carefully, has to be done in a way, as I said, that's, that's attuned to local cultures. So that is a, a quick review of a, a work product that took 18 months in the making. Um, I just want to conclude with, with something I said earlier, which is that um, I think having a governance structure in place like this has been good not just for Ben & Jerry's. I think it's been really good for Unilever. I think, as I said before, I think the Ben & Jerry's transaction is a success within Unilever's. It's a success because the governance structure has required you no know, protection of the social mission and the Ben & Jerry's brand. Now, it's true that we could argue about different issues along the interface, but by and large, I think it has been, uh, in a large measure, responsible for the success of that transaction within Unilever. So with that, I turn this back over to, uh, to you, Terry.